Um, so you're all ready for lightning socks again? Okay. Right, great. Um, so uh, I know it says on the screen that Aaron will be doing the lightning talks, but uh, <laughs> Quinn here is kindly enough to do, uh, uh, to, uh, do the lightning socks. I see Aaron has just dropped in as well. All right. So um, just hand it over to Quinn for the lightning talks. Please welcome Quinn Norton. Hello, so welcome to Lightning Talks. If you're not familiar with the format, these are a series of uh, quick five minute talks about things people are passionate about, things they've started working on, things that don't quite fill a 10 minute talk. Sometimes they're just really funny and sometimes they're technically quite thick. So you never know what you're gonna get. It's a real grab bag, um, it's a great time. Now, uh, one quick word, if you are signed up to give a lightning talk and you have not yet seen that gentleman in the dark shirt over there, please, please get up and go do that right now. Um, <laughs> the walk of not shame, that's what that is. <laughs> the walk of pride. Um, so we have two more days of lightning talks. Uh, we don't have them all filled up. So if you are either inspired by what you see here today or merely internally inspired to, uh, to get up where I am now and spend five minutes explaining your passions and your work to, uh, to, to an audience here at Shaw. Please go to the wiki and sign up for that. I have a question. I'm sorry? Um, it is filmed. Uh, you can, I believe, opt out. However, I will kick that over to the angel to confirm. Hello? Look, look up real quick. <laughs> I believe you can opt out, but let me double check. Can Lightning uh, Talks opt out of the recording? Uh, in general. <laughs> We're going to have a small conference. We're going to have a small Lightning Talk. Yes. Yes. If you would like to give a Lightning Talk and you need to opt out, that is an option for you. All right. Uh, uh, my, first, uh, my first question to all of you is, is MH in the room? Yeah. Ah, here comes MH. MH, head over there, I'm going to finish up. So please, we've got plenty of spots. Come and fill them. Stand where I am now. Uh, so we got a really, really interesting selection of people coming up here. Uh, and we want to go ahead and get that started, but I'm going to fill a little bit more time while MH gets started here. MH is going to be talking to us about um, cheap electronic locks, uh, picking electronics locks, and presumably what that process has taught him about making a better electronic lock. Um, because you should definitely leave your precious data in your computer in your hotel room behind your key card. <laughs> All right. And this is MH. Everyone give him a big round of applause. Sorry. Hey. Hi. Can, OK, you can hear me great. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Michael. I'm a, uh, I'm a lock picker, uh, or you could call it a lock enthusiast. I'm a penetration tester, lock collector, and so on. And uh, locks really are my passion. So um, if you're also into locks, then you should look at the links in the presentation. I think there's a presentation, right? No? Oh, um, the, the one I sent to Nick. Do, do you have a plan to, to show slides? Say again? Oh, it's not from Ohm. It's something I sent to. Yeah. Yeah, we can swap, and maybe I can just copy the presentation then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and use this one for the moment. Andrea, are you ready to rock? <laughs> All right. Andrea is a visual artist. She is going to be talking to us about. Um, an innovative international art project that's using a lot of different forms of messaging, including miniature painted art, stories, and messages, technology to connect to different people. Uh, please give Andrea a big round of applause. Thank you very much for coming up in short notice. <laughs> Hello. 
Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm here to talk about. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to talk about uh, Camino Stones, which is my art project. So in 2015, I walked from Espanyol, France, to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and this route, this trail, is called the Camino. And I carried out my first art project with miniature painted stones. So this is uh, the route I walked. I walked for two and a half months with only the minimum I needed in my backpack. So this was just enough to live. And I carried the stuff for my art project, which uh, was 61 painted miniature stones. So it was really a great art project. Um, and it changed my life. And it also changed, touched some of the lives of the people I met who were involved in this art project. So walking this trail, uh, the idea for Camino Stones was born. And Camino Stones is an art project which combines miniature painted stone, stones, messages or stories, and technology to connect people and to inspire people. So basis of this art project are messages and stories that I get from participants. And for each story, I paint two identical stones like these ones. One of these stones becomes part of an art route on one of the existing international trails. You see the stone on the left. The second stone I leave also on this trail, but it will start its journey. So people will take this stone. Each stone has its own QR code and its own web page. So how does it work? The first stone which becomes part of an art route, I attach below the signs on the existing trails. So people walking these trails are always looking for these signs to get the right direction. As I did myself when I walked to Santiago, um, they look for the signs and then they see the stone attached and hopefully when they see the QR code and the web link, they will go to the page and then they discover the message or the story behind the painted stone. And it's easy for them to respond to this message or this story, and I hope this will happen. Uh, and it's also very easy for them to read about this art project. And if they are interested also in the stories and messages of the other stones, they can very easily upload a free GPX file or find the map to discover the other stones and the other locations of the stones. So this is one part of the project. The second stone, has also a QR code and a web link attached to the back of the stone. And as you see on the label, on the right side, uh, it stimulates, stimulates people to take the stone. They read again the message or the story behind the painting, and they can then leave the stone on a new location. And they can very easy uh, point, uh, uh, press a button so I get the new location, I get the GPS coordinates of the new location. And so this stone 
starts to travel and starts its own journey. And the meaning is that it will spread the story or the message behind the painting and that people will respond to it or even leave their own story. And it touches the life, lives of the people it meets. So just a week ago, uh, eight days ago, I returned from a walk of 500 kilometers uh, to lay out my third art route, uh, which uh, consists of 20 miniature painted stones. And this stone on the left was one of these stones. So this route is in Holland from Pieterbure to the St. Pietersberg. And for the first time this year, I also left 20 traveling stones on the route. So when I started this trail of 500 kilometers, I carried 40 stones in my backpack. And each day I left two identical stones on the trail. For the people following this project or participating, it was a surprise each day which stones I left on the trail, where I left them, and how, for the participants, their stones looked. Because people give me their message or story, but they don't know how I visualize it. So it remains a surprise until I leave the stone. So this was really great. Uh, after a week, I have the first um, data about this. So 10 out of 20 traveling stones actually started to travel, and I got a lot of responses uh, and stories from the people who saw the stones on the trails. So I'm really enthusiastic about this project. I have a lot of ideas uh, about the future. The meaning is that this will become an ongoing project. So next year, I plan to walk from Holland again to Santiago de Compostela to lay out uh, part of the project, which is a fourth art route. Um, so this is just one of the plans. I will very uh, fast skip to the... Um, to the last bit of this uh, pitch, because I like to talk about this project. It always uh, takes a long time. So uh, why am I telling you about this? What I found out myself was that by walking um, and getting out of my comfort zone, I got the best ideas for creativity, because I'm an art painter, but also the best ideas for this project and the challenges it gives me, because uh, the website I built for most part uh, myself. So what I want now from you is if you're interested that you start walking the beautiful trails uh, and if you like it also the art routes uh, on the trails and get inspired by the uh, messages and the stories and the paintings uh, that you find on the trail. And then I have some last information. Okay, so this is a trail I walked uh, of 500 kilometers. And this is some contact uh, information. Uh, on the bottom you see uh, the art route page where you can find uh, the GPX files if you're interested or the maps to follow uh, the art routes and also uh, my email address. Uh, if you have any ideas, I'm really open for this uh, or suggestions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sorry I wasn't here on time. I was giving a presentation in another tent, and despite uh, practicing all my life, I have not yet mastered teleporting or being in two places at once. Um, so thanks to Quinn for starting everything off and uh, getting, getting the lightning talks going. Um, I also wanted to apologize. We've had some trouble with the lightning talks and some technical difficulties. Uh, things have been chopping and changing. We haven't been able to schedule them. So my apologies to everyone who wants to uh, do a lightning talk today. But maybe uh, I could see a show of hands of all the people who want to do lightning talks. Yeah? Wow. A lot of audience, but not so many speakers. That's good. That's good. I like that. So um, once again, thanks to Andrea for the first uh, lightning talk. It's a lot of... A lot of, uh, you know, a challenge to get up here and speak to all of you. You're, you're very intimidating people. You don't say anything in response. Um, but you do giggle, so that's good. All right, so MH is going to be up next, and I believe is speaking to us about electronic lock fail. Nice round of applause. Thank you.
Okay, sorry about sending the email with the presentation to the wrong person, but um, here we have it. <laughs> uh, so as I said, I am very enthusiastic about locks, and if you're also interested in locks, then have a look at these organizations, um, SSDEF <laughs> and Tool. And Tool also has a tent, it's just um, 20, min 20 meters or so away. And so you can visit us. So today, I brought this lock, but uh, <laughs> I can't put all in my hands, so I brought also some pictures of the lock. Um, okay, usually my talks about locks are a little bit longer, but uh, this one fits into five minutes, and you'll see why in four minutes. Um, this is an electronic lock cylinder. It goes into a door. Um, this is like the, the lock that goes into the door. And then there is a uh, knob on the outside, and a knob on the inside, and uh, basically on the inside of the door you can always turn, but on the outside you have to enter a secret code first. Right, so <clears throat> this is a um, typical electronic knob lock cylinder, and um, there, are, there are many of these locks available on the market. Uh, this one is from China, and one year ago about, I saw a number of these locks on the Chinese website, and uh, I said, well, hmm, it's not too interesting. There are so many, <clears throat> it's, but, but this is like basically like another bag of rice in China that will fall over. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, last month, uh, a German mail order company uh, decided to put this into their catalog. So it's now being sold for 50 euro, and that's a really cheap price for an electronic lock. Typically, you pay about 150, oh, so. 200 euro, or even more. Uh, 50 euro is really cheap, so I... So thing people going. like cheap locks. Um, people will put this into their doors. Let's have a look. And then I said, 50 euro I can invest. It may <clears throat> have some. Uh, it may offer some fun of reverse engineering. So um, when I also I wanted to show you a little bit about electronic locks. Um, there is always a mechanical element in there because it actually has to couple something or block something. And that could be a uh, electromagnet that pulls in something, uh, or it could be a motor. The electromagnet is typically not so good because um, uh, you would uh, be able to hammer on it or put a strong magnet there, and people have done that. And the motor is typically a little bit better because it's harder to make a turn from the outside. Although, um, if you have seen this presentation, that's a padlock, and uh, you can actually uh, turn the motor from the outside. But um, here, um, uh, this is the door, the light blue thing, and you are kind of um, unable to, to, act, <clears throat> to turn the motor by, by magnets. Um, so that's good. On the other hand, um, what you can do is uh, push here, or hammer here, and then the spring-loaded piece will, uh, uh, will go in. So if you, if you look at this video on, on YouTube, um, you'll find a video where you can see that if you take a hammer drill to this lock, it will actually um, uh, operate uh, the lock and the lock will open. So that is kind of, um, that's not good. Then again, um, if you take a really strong hammer drill to a door, you may have another problem anyway. So, um, and also I wanted to look at the electronics and that, that's where the fun starts, right? So. Um, if uh, the motor is protected in the door <clears throat> and all the electronics are on the outside and the keypad and everything, uh, there should be some, some PCB here uh, with a microcontroller and then there should be a secure protocol. Uh, basically, uh, I can reverse engineer that. That was my idea. <clears throat> That's a good investment, I thought. Uh, it should take some time, but then there should be something like a, a side channel attack or uh, you could actually um, use this James Bond style thing that tries all the possible codes in microseconds, right? <clears throat> and that's, that's possible because the, the time penalty that's here when you enter the incorrect code, um, that is um, easily stopped when you um, cut the battery power. So that was all a nice idea, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, unfortunately that's where my investment <clears throat> seemed to be a failure. There is no crypto challenge. There is a little plastic cap here in front of um, the outside knob. Uh, this one, when you take this off, it looks like this. Um, there are two cables and there is um, no protocol, but these are the motor cables. So 
Yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, I'm sure one can make uh, one can make a, a better and um, uh, still cheap lock, and it's not easily readable. But uh, if you go to theopensourcelock.org, uh, we will make a better one. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Microphone check. All right. Excellent. I love lightning talks. I've always enjoyed uh, seeing different speakers get up, speak for the first time, speak for the last time, speak many, many times. Um, hopefully it'll be the last time I ever speak. I'm sure you're sick of me. But our next speaker is going to speak to us about a topic uh, close to his heart and I guess uh, many people's. Um, it is about uh, prohibition. It's about a kind of prohibition, I guess, that exists uh, still in the US, US of A. Uh, does not necessarily exist here in Holland. So um, once the presentation is set up, we will be uh, speaking to you. Rather, I won't be speaking to you. Um, Genesis RE will be speaking to you about the history of legalization of cannabis in the USA. Hmm? While the slides are working, I can still entertain you a little bit. Yeah. I gave this talk uh, a few months ago in London, and this talk was scheduled for the much longer period of time, so I'll be just going boom, 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 one slide after another, no time to waste. Cool. Uh, tell me, where is the timer? That's me. <laughs> okay. Uh, basically, everything I say is based on data, research, science, data, because uh, cannabis are, is a controversial subject. Because for 50 years there was a prohibition and the drugs are bad, uh, just say no. Now we have internet and we have research, data, science, common sense, rational thinking. Whenever you are in doubt, just ask yourself a question, does it make sense? follow the money, so I always appear to logic, research, science, and data. Uh, this is me and selfie picture on Instagram, uh, introduction to cannabis industry. This is still very new in Europe. In the US, it is the fastest uh, growing, uh, yeah, pun intended, the fastest growing industry. Uh, this is me and my two kids at the hemp farm in the UK. Hemp is the non-psychoactive, so it is, uh, hemp is not psychoactive and uh, it is legal, you need to have a license. These are some of my content. I am pretty much active in this psychedelic space. I'm editing Wikipedia, I'm going to conferences, I'm pretty much educating people, telling them that drugs are not always bad. This is just a general conception over 50 years of propaganda. Now we have data, research, science, and there is a distinction between hemp and cannabis. Hemp is non-psychoactive. The psychoactive component is uh, THC. However, hemp has a very low THC. It has a CBD, which is another uh, comp complementary ingredient, uh, and it is legal in the UK. Uh, this is a, a TEDx talk uh, called the trillion dollar crop because the hemp has so many different uses. So this is just one infographic that you can, food, oil, fiber, like so many uses. And uh, someone asked a question about biofuels because hemp can be also used for uh, fuel. And uh, <laughs> there are so many uses. It's just, when you just Google hemp use, you will see a thousand and thousands of examples. This is a very versatile crop. And in the UK, you can just get a license and, and you, you can do this. I am sorry, I am a little bit of a hypocrite. I live in a, in a city, I do not have a field, but I just feel like I need to learn how to properly grow, grow hemp. Otherwise, uh, my, my experience is not, not full. So next time, on the next uh, hacker camp, uh, th th this will be not the lightning talk about history of the cannabis, it will be the actual lessons and experiences from growing your own farm, completely legal, completely following all the regulations. 
Uh, so yes, hemp is non-psychoactive, cannabis is psychoactive, and as of now, 2017, it is still mostly illegal in Europe, while in the US, it is changing. Uh, back in, the, uh, it was October or November 2016, there was the presidential election, Trump and Clinton. On the very same day, there was a many, in many states, there was a referendum about, do you want to make cannabis legal for recreational use? Because it was already legal for medical uses. So now we have like nine states where cannabis is completely legal, even for, to foreigners. But because it is illegal on the federal law, uh, then they need to operate like cash-only business because banks cannot open their bank account. It is just, just ridiculous. In the Canada, uh, cannabis is also becoming legal. It's like uh, there are some stock, uh, stocks, companies trading on the exchange, 300% return per year. And by the way, give me some... Uh, Time estimate, because I can talk and talk and talk. Okay, so that was unexpected. Huh? Yeah, sure. So, in the UK, there are places where chief police officer, we are not chasing cannabis anymore. Uh, in the Christiana, which is the Denmark, uh, in, in Copenhagen, they have legal cannabis. Of course, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, there is legal cannabis. In Holland, there is legal cannabis. There is a lot of research and data. Na, 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 na. It was because some guy had a patent for the wood pulp, and because he wanted to use this patent for production of paper from wood, so he made the cannabis illegal. Usually, there is a timer, and someone gives me the uh, time, but it's okay. So who benefits from illegal drugs? pharmaceuticals, alcohol, tobacco, private prison system, and of course, drug cartels. So uh, please uh, follow the money. LSD became illegal because of a war in Vietnam. They had to undermine peace movements. Follow the money, be rational. This, I can talk on and on. I'll leave you to it. The world is over now. Uh, cannabis is becoming legal, it's just the legal system that needs to catch up. More and more countries will say, we will not prosecute some uh, cannabis smokers. I actually decided next, to, so sure do not smoke cannabis because I need to be consistently high on life. Consistent energy and uh, any drug use or misuse can put me uh, outside of my sleep cycle, outside of my regular energy. So be the change you want to see in the world, and you can always find me. I'm everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, lightning talks. It's always difficult to get up on stage. Uh, I can't say that I have ever consumed any exotic substances, even in countries where it's legal, but I know that when I do, I lose track of time. So. Um, <laughs> It's quite common. We have a joke in English as well, which is, uh, what's the shortest word in the English language? <laughs> Ear. Um, next up, we have the notebook thief. And he's uh, presumably speaking to us about... I'm a good person. You're a good person. Okay, so this is uh, Vadim Makarov talking about tracking stolen notebooks, I believe, right? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not the thief. Okay, well, just before you get started, are there any other people who want to give a lightning talk here today? Because we need to know. Um, I know that I have Raphael uh, at Luxity. You wanted to give a talk too, right? So get your slides done. Anybody else? No? Okay, the stage is yours. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a little story. So I had a little experience two years ago while I was attending a conference in Geneva. Uh, so I am a scientist, and, but this is the, about classical information technology. I'm a quantum scientist. So I went to the single for okay, uh, a scientific workshop where we discussed very advanced topics like quantum memories and single photon detectors and all so on and so forth, and talked with scientists, and the workshop was a success. Uh, everything went smoothly until the last lab tour of Nikola Gizen's uh, labs at the University of Geneva. So this is the mansion where a famous scientist works, and he has labs there, so we went there, went around the labs, 
And then somebody walked in the meeting room and stole a bag containing a notebook of one American postdoc with his Japanese and American passports. Oh, okay, Japanese passports with US visa. So the guy was literally stranded in Switzerland for a month until he could get a new passport and a new US visa. And also uh, the thief uh, took a notebook from my bag. This notebook. This one. Uh, I went to police, and the police said, well, I asked, are you going to take fingerprints? We have everything, like, left the scene of crime. They said, no, okay, is anybody killed? No. Go to your insurance company. They are not going to do anything. Little did the thief now that I had a piece of tracking software on a notebook called Prey. This is uh, free to use. It, it's not open source but uh, you can sign up for the basic account for free. Six hours later, the notebook went online. Uh, so here you see the time, and oh, this is the Windows running and whatever, and if we have a piece of map, and we see the notebook is be being set up to connect to a network, and we have a new user of the notebook. So this is from the notebook camera. Besides, we also have, okay, we, we see what processor it is running and who is the vendor of the notebook and the serial number and whatever and what network it is connected to. And interestingly, we have uh, we, the reports, so the website gives you a report and uh, you see that the notebook is connected, is seeing a lot of wireless networks with all the names and signal strengths. Uh, so the interesting information is, of course, the map. The website gives you a tracking map and says the notebook is somewhere around the circle. How many people now? So can you raise your hand if you know? If you know how the notebook knows its own location. So it, it is found on the map. The notebook does not have a GPS. Raise your hand if you know how it knows its location. Okay, about half the people now. So this is information security technology conference. Of course, I expect you to know, but half the people have no clue. And I had no clue either. So this is a good time to call the police. And of course, I go to the hotel reception, call the police, say, hi, this is not an emergency, but uh, here is a notebook which reports itself. Let's go and catch the chief. The police, the Swiss police, arrives, two cars, two uniformed officers, two plain clothes officers, comes in, looks at my report, in half an hour, in 30 minutes, so very good police in Switzerland, and I say, you know, hi, here's a problem. This is Switzerland. And this is France. So we have, <laughs> we, we can't go there, but we have to drive you on the board to the border and connect you to the French police. I say, yes, they put me in a car, drive, and everything is in motion. Uh, yep, so what I was really concerned is uh, how do I protect my data? I mean, the notebook is stolen, I have to cancel three credit cards, reset 20 passwords. So let's see what the, what the thief is doing. So he's connecting to the network, and he's a happy guy because he just got a lot of valuable data. He can sell my private data, maybe look at my documents, um, publish my unfinished papers, and he went somewhere away. Away, you get a picture every five minutes and a screenshot. And he is calling on phone, saying, hi, I have a lot of valuable data. How much? Is it $3,000, $5,000? I want to sell. But then you look what he is searching for, and he's searching for TV program. Easy. Turns out he is interested in player transfers between football teams. And he is a really big fan of Champion League. He spends the next 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should be thankful. The French thief affair, they wear trousers when they stand in front of camera. Yeah, and he spends next 10 minutes pondering of the Champion League tournament table. Very puzzling. And then another player transfer, and another player transfer, and one more player transfer, he went away, and now, now there's another player transfer. Very, very, very good. And he looks at this picture. And this is about when the police is knocking on his door. 
and the police asks me to switch on the sound alarm on the notebook because there is a function in the software pray which allows you to get the sound. And by the way, the location reported now is incorrect because when every time I press this button, it locks on some, somebody's network and now it's in Norway. It was in Germany seven minutes ago. So it, at this place, you will never find your notebook. Okay, now it's in Netherlands, but not, not where we are. But police asks me to say the alarm. But just to make sure that this is my notebook. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Scheduled. Um. Okay, fine. The police faces a problem. So how did they find this location? You remember the circle. The circle is five buildings like this, so more than 100 apartments. And there is nothing in your information technology which will help police to find exactly in which apartment the thief is. They have their own methods. Dogs. Tracking, database, they say that this is somebody we might know from the picture, and so on. So notebook is recovered, and happily, oh, yeah. And the, the, when they come to the apartment, the thief confesses instantly. They ask, hi, did you steal those notebooks from the University of Geneva today? He says, okay, yes, yes, I did. Easy case. He admitted guilt on the spot. Then they ask, where are the passports? The passports are valuable. This is a big, of, big cost and a lot of expense for the person who lost the passports. And he says, sorry, I threw them away. No passports, I just took the notebooks. So the police goes into this building, the, the thief is there on the third floor, and goes to the garbage chute of the building, like communal garbage chute. They have the key, go in the room where the chute ends, open the chute, out comes a ah, big pile of kitchen refuse. And in the pile of kitchen refuse, there are passports and other papers, all wet and smelly. So everything recovered, except. So I need to reach this postdoc, the poor postdoc who thinks he's spending next month in Switzerland. I, I, I don't have his contact, I email his professor. A big American professor with a lot of grants, group of 20 people strong, because it's all oh, wonderful. My guy will be back to work next Monday. Problem solved. How, by the way, did the police recover the printouts of the research papers I have marked up? I look through, no papers. I asked the police, did you take pick everything from the garbage chute? They say, well, maybe not. Are those papers important? I say, yes, if the professor is emailing, yes. And they go back to the building and pick the papers. And the postdoc confirms, everything smells really, really bad. <laughs> okay, chief is caught, this is his name, this is his court papers, he's a repeat offender, this is the second time he gets caught for the same crime, and the justice is restored. In conclusion, I mean, I had the most wonderful evening. I work in information security, but my research is never as fun as in real time chasing and catching a criminal with a, with a police team, which is maybe 12 people strong, with dogs, cars, everybody, going around to, after the criminal. And the second conclusion, how the people in this room don't know how the information technology works. We rely on it, but you have no idea what the tracking is. On the street, almost nobody will know. One percent, less than one percent. Thanks. Wrap it up. Cool. Mm. Thank you. So, um, lightning talk should be a party. I don't know about you. I think it's a party. We started off with artwork, and then we went to uh, cannabis, and then we went to hemp, and then we went to uh, laptop thievery. So uh, when I think of a party, that's what I think of, right? Is that what you think of? You sure? Not like ponies and rainbows and balloons and cake? That's what you think of? All right, cool. Well, we'll try and keep in that theme. This is a friend of mine, uh, Rafael Vino. Uh, I've watched his work for many years. I have no idea what he's going to speak to you about, but I always listen whenever he speaks. So no doubt it'll be some cool software that he's working on. He's always uh, making new tools and impressing me with various things. And then we have one other speaker, and we'll wrap up for the day and start again tomorrow. So are you guys enjoying the Lightning Talks so far? Yeah? Fantastic. 
Once again, apologies that Nick Farr isn't here. Uh, I don't know the reasons behind all of that, so you can ask him or ask uh, the organizers. Uh, but we're very glad that we're still having the lightning talks, and maybe he'll be joining us uh, tomorrow. My name is Aaron Leverett. I'm known as BSB uh, when I'm known at all. Has anyone heard of me? See? See? Thank you. Um, yeah. So I like doing lightning talks because I used to be in the circus, and so we used to do variety shows, um, burlesque, cabaret, that sort of stuff. And my favorite thing about variety is uh, the variety. <laughs> oh, God, it's endless. He doesn't mean burlesque that. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'm saving the fan dance for the last day, right? Boylesque, it's a thing. No, I can't do the splits. I'm too old. Look at me, I'm gray. It's because of all the splits. Um, all right. Oh, there's visualization. There's graphics. There's a web browser. Wow. OK. It's off the hook. Stand back. All right. Give uh, Rafael a round of applause. Hey. So um, when you open your web browser and you load the web page, you end up having all the stuff showing up in your, in your browser. And it loads a bunch of uh, JavaScript and a bunch of documents from all kinds of websites. So one of the plugins you can use to find out what's going on is going to be Lightbeam. Lightbeam is a, a Firefox plugin. And when you load a page, it's going to show you, OK, so github.com loaded all those web pages. Um, but most of you probably already use a bunch of plugins to block uh, ads or to block uh, JavaScript, so it will not really be useful for you, but you want to help some other people using that are not particularly technically competent or not really interested into that to find out what's going on when they load a web page. Um, and to do that, I decided to look a bit at what exists around, which kind of tools uh, you, can, you can play with. Uh, to, to investigate in that. So the first one I found is Scrappy. Scrappy will uh, help you to uh, crawl a web page. And you can go, so you can uh, grab a bunch of stuff. You can get a bunch of uh, regexes, and you can extract a bunch of documents from the web page and use it to load uh, other URLs. Uh, it's really cool, but it doesn't do any uh, JavaScript uh, interpretation. So it will not load all the ads, for example. Um, so the next one um, I looked at is Splash. Splash is a full, it's a JavaScript rendering service, which means it's basically a WebKit uh, browser that um, is instrumented, so you can uh, run, send a web page, and it's going to load it, run all the JavaScript, uh, and give you an output, a nice output of uh, what's going on on that web page. So I'm going to show you here how that looks like. So let's say I'm going to run it on Google.com. And so it will get Google, it will get Google web page and uh, show you what is loaded, all the, all the external links and all the JavaScript and so on. So all that stuff is relatively nice, but it's really complicated to uh, automate that thing and to make, uh, to, to run it multiple times and to, uh, to play with the output of that data. Um, so I looked a bit further and uh, find, uh, find a library that is going to connect Splash and Scrappy together, meaning you can uh, get, a, get a domain, load it uh, in, um, in Splash, run all the JavaScript, get in your Python code uh, all, the, all, the data, all the interesting data especially uh, something called Internet Archive, so HRR files. I don't know if you know, so, know that. It's basically just a, a plain JSON document that contains all the uh, cookies and all the URLs loaded uh, from one web page. So it's really cool, but um, you still need to put some glue to have all that stuff together and, uh, and run it from third-party services. So if you want to have your own, like if you want to create a web page, you can use to run uh, a bunch of crawling on multiple domains. You need to put some more glue together. And also, um, that thing is nice, but it will not really show you what's going on, because what I'm mostly interested in is finding out which domains are loaded when I load a, when I load a, a website. 
So I decided to look at another uh, visualization library that's going to be, it's called uh, ETE Toolkit. And it's mostly used to, um, to display uh, phylogenetic uh, trees. So it's a really cool library that will help you to do all you want to do with trees. So you can merge them together, you can search through it, you can connect stuff together. Uh, so it's a really, really nice library that will help you to play, to do all the stuff, you, all, everything you want to do with a tree. Um, but again, all that thing, it's another library that you want to connect um, with, your, uh, with your crawler. Um, so what I decided to do from there is to create a library that is going to get HR files. So all the URLs loaded from one web page and connect them together in a tree. Uh, and uh, give you a nice uh, PDF document containing all the domains loaded from one, uh, one single website. Um, and I wanted to also have a small wrapper to make it easy to run, uh, to crawl a website uh, from, from a script. So all that stuff is open source on GitHub. If you want to have a look, uh, feel free to do so. Um, and I'm going to show you now on all, all those libraries connected together. All the glue, like I put a lot of glue and connect all those scripts uh, in one single um, project. It's called Lucky Lou. Um, Lucky Lou, which means um, like connecting, uh, like digging, uh, looking into, um, like what, finding out what other people are doing with, uh, with your data. So like you just want to find out who is going to look at your data when you browse the website. Uh, and it's going to look like that at the end. So this one is running on my own machine, so don't, don't look it up on the internet, it will, not, it will not work. But what you get from that is a document like that. So I, lo I loaded lemonde.fr, which is a French uh, news website, and when you load just one page on lemonde.com, so only the, uh, the home page, that's, what's gonna, that's what happens. All those domains are also loaded. So it goes extremely far. And you don't have to do anything, it just, Le Monde.fr in your browser, and that's what happened. So that's quite impressive. I didn't really investigate much more into that, but that's what you will have by just opening that in uh, Chrome. Um, and I have a few other examples. So, for example, if I go for La Libre, so a Belgian website, um, it will also look like that. So that's what happened when you load La Libre. That goes quite far. Um, all those domains are loaded one after the other, uh, mostly using JavaScript. So this one is like daily motion loading a bunch of random stuff. Uh, not so random, but yeah, that's what happens. Um, and if I go then on another website, for example, on Wired, um, that's what happens. So it's like, it's not as insane, but it's still relatively, relatively deep. Uh, and what is nice with that project is that you can also run it uh, uh, you can uh, configure the depth of, uh, of the crawling. So you can say, okay, I want to crawl the home page and also all the, um, all the URLs of the same domain on that home page. And that's what happened. I just, I just ran it on buzzfeed.com and it's what happened uh, with the depth uh, equals to two. So basically, home page and then all the links to uh, buzzfeed.com on the home page. So again, it's quite impressive. And yeah, that's, um, it's going to be public. I'm going to put a public website at some point soon. Um, it's, uh, so that's what is the home page. Um, yeah, so that's roughly what I wanted to talk about. If you have any further questions, I will be around and floating around the camp um, for the next few days. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So uh, quite a party, right? We've had uh, art, we've had drugs, we've had uh, crime, and now we have crazy visuals as well, which just leaves us with one thing after the end of a great party. You want to have some nice memories. Uh, I have some very nice memories of a hackerspace in Oslo called Hackeria, which is uh, where I met this guy. I still consider myself sort of to be a member, even though I don't pay dues, because that's what I'm like. Um, I, try and, I try and do nice stuff for them at various points um, and pay my dues. But he's going to talk to you about archiving so that we can all have nice memories of the events here today. Uh, this is my friend at Luxity uh, to give us the final talk of the Lightning Talks today. And then Yuko will give us a, a few more comments. And we'll wrap up and we'll begin again tomorrow with more Lightning Talks. So at Luxity, here you go. Thank you.
Hey guys, thanks. Uh, I literally made this talk while I was sitting here and I'm not a very experienced speaker, so I'm sorry if my timing is off and stuff. Uh, who here knows about Archive Team? You're awesome, cool. <laughs> uh, that's also great because if people knew about it, it wouldn't be too fun. Uh, we are here to rescue your shit. Who are we? Uh, created by Jason Scott. He's a colorful American. Um, in 2009, we're a bunch of rogue archivists and programmers and writers and general loudmouths. Um, we try to save digital heritage before it's lost forever. And uh, we try to do it with a bit of an attitude. We're not really afraid of stepping on anyone's toes. Uh, and we're not affiliated with the Internet Archive. Um, we just like them. Um, so, um, we have some examples of, of uh, winnings from, from the past. We saved GeoCities. Do you remember GeoCities? It's awesome. It's still under construction. It's a topical page on the Internet Archive about all the under construction GeoCity sites. Um, they were bought by Yahoo in, in 1999. Uh, Yahoo uh, severely pissed on them and then sold them and, no, it's, and then shut them down. So we downloaded them. Uh, we saved Yahoo videos and we saved Friendster. That's some examples of what we do. So why do we do it? Because history is our future. And so far we've been trashing it. And we try to make up for that a bit. Um, it's not really our job to figure out what is valuable today, to figure out what is meaningful. We save it and then uh, someone will probably do something with it in the future. It's hard to do something with it if we didn't save it. Oh. We try to work with the three virtues. Rage, paranoia, and kleptomania. We feel like they go pretty well together. Um, rage because some um, private institution is uh, deciding that our history is no longer to be online. That sucks. And yeah. Um, we accomplished this by distributing the download tasks to lots of people. We have uh, something called a warrior. That's a virtual machine that is set up so that you can just press play, browse to the IP, and then you see stuff downloading and it's generating traffic and you're helping us. It's fetching what to download and you're uploading and you're being friendly. Um, I've heard it's a great way, if anyone is setting up a, the infrastructure for a, for a cloud solution, it's a great way to better test the CPUs and stuff like that. So um, I, I recommend that. It generates a lot, of, uh, a lot of sessions in the TCPs and the networks and all that. Uh, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, it, uh, you're, you're, you are able. You are able to help us. Um, you can stop using Yahoo products because Yahoo sucks. They uh, they they consistently find ways to to delete uh, massive amounts of history in very short time. So please stop using Yahoo. Uh, you can help by downloading downloading an archive team warrior and. Um, Running that when your computer is idling. It's not always going to have some tasks, but when it do, it's really helpful. Um, and you can find out more information on archiveteam.org or IRC on AFNet on the Archive Team channel. That was basically my talk. Okay, so um, today's lightning talks were very much like my last trip to Amsterdam. Uh, I went there with a bunch of money in my pocket, 
I had some wild parties that I kind of vaguely remember. I have these fractured archives of, and I left with a stupid hat and some bruises from bicycles. Um, and this set of lightning talks feels pretty much the same way. I've had fun. I hope that you've had fun. I hope you'll come back and see some more lightning talks. I want to applaud all the speakers again, uh, except for myself, of course, um, for getting up and speaking in front of everybody. It's difficult to get up and give a talk. And uh, I was pretty impressed with all of the talks that we saw today. So thanks again to the speakers.